We stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board, I need approval of the agenda. I have a couple additions. Um, under eight, I'd like to add a B and move the existing B to C. Update on joint, and I'd like B to be update on joint resolution action. And then C would be review of the face covering policy. Under 10, I would like to add F, which is policy 1-22. I'm sorry, Ms. Heintel. It's 1-12. I was a typo in my notes. So make that F is uh, 10F is policy 1-12. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And I will turn it over to Mrs. Hindtail, who will present the John H. Crowder Service Award and, along with Sun Valley High School. Okay. The late John H. Crowder spent more than 30 years serving the children of Union County. As a living tribute, tribute to him and his legacy, the Union County Board of Education awards the John H. Crowder Service Award every month to an outstanding high school student who is making a difference in their school and community. Students who receive this award are not only academically successful, but also have an established history of community service. Tonight, we award the John H. Crowder Service Award for February to a senior at Sun Valley High School. Kayla Radman has been an active four-year participant in the Beta Club and is an involved leader with the Extremely Active Student Council. She was inducted into the National Otter Society as a sophomore and participates in the service opportunities that NHS and Beta sponsor at the high school and within the community each semester. She has also been involved with the Green Team for the past three years, pursuing campus beautification, and the community service endeavors. In addition to her varied extracurricular involvement in clubs and academic honor societies, Kayla has participated in a number of volunteer service projects. She has brought supplies, bags to the homeless population in Charlotte, volunteered at fundraising activities to help rebuild schools in Haiti, helped at a soup kitchen, served at a rescue animal adoption event, and has been part of the Reading Buddies program, helping elementary school students learn to read. Kayla has also helped to lead the children's holiday party each year, where the student council raises over $20,000 to provide holiday cheer to 20 local families in the Sun Valley cluster. Kayla has also played soccer at the club level for the past seven years, serving as a captain for several for several seasons due to her leadership skills and ability to motivate others. Board members, please join me in congratulating Kayla Radman as the February 2022 recipient of the John H. Crowder Service Award. Congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations. I will now turn it over to Dr. Harris for the Influencers Award. Good evening. Good evening. We are pleased to recognize two outstanding employees who have been named UCPS Influencers for February 2022. This program celebrates the passion, dedication, and hard work of UCPS employees. Each month, our staff members, students, families, and community members nominate UCPS employees to be recognized for the positive influences they've had on our organization. 
Tonight, I am honored to present Ms. Kelly Mills, a counselor at Cuthbertson High, and Ms. Candy Bunch, curriculum assistant for the academics department. I will now invite the nominators to the podium to read their submissions and recognize our honorees' accomplishments. Good evening, I'm Andy Brooks. I'm an assistant principal at Cuthbertson High School, and I'm reading the nomination on behalf of a parent that was unable to attend tonight's meeting. Ms. Mills, will you please come forward? Ms. Mills is passionate about helping and supporting the students at Cuthbertson High School. She is attentive to students' needs, communicates with parents openly, and is available and responsible every day. Ms. Mills, is, Ms. Mills volunteers tirelessly for her after school events such as athletics, as does her husband, Nate, supports students who are quarantined with their academics, and provides a welcoming and safe space for students who are struggling emotionally. Ms. Mills is truly an asset to Cuthbertson High School and we are so grateful she is guiding our CHS students. Thank you. Good evening. I am Dr. Susan Rogers, Director of K-12 Curriculum and Instruction, and I am pleased to present Ms. Candy Bunch for this award. Candy, will you please come forward? Candy inspires me because of her expertise in making relationships matter in her role as curriculum assistant. She communicates with all UCPS schools in order to meet the curriculum and instructional needs presented. She has helped me as a new director to get up on my feet and find my forward momentum. Her positivity is greatly noticed and appreciated. She is a valued member of our curriculum team. Congratulations. Y'all keep standing. I will now read the UCPS Influencers Proclamation from the Board of Education and Dr. Houlihan. Whereas the Union County Board of Education values the hard work of each employee within the district, whereas performance is an essential part of district operations, whereas Kelly Mills and Candy Bunch exemplify the performance, dedication, and teamwork essential to the success of the district and its students. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Education for the Union County Public School System and Dr. Andrew G. Houlihan, Superintendent, hereby proclaim Kelly Mills and Kelly, Kelly Candy Bunch, excuse me, <laughs> as the Union County Public Schools Influencer for the month of February 2022. Congratulations on this outstanding honor and thank you for all that you do each and every day to be a positive influence. Thank you. That brings us to public comments. As there is a waiting list, public comments will be expanded up to 60 minutes. At every regular meeting, of the board up to 60 minutes have been allotted for public comments. The board will not respond to public comments. However, a member may ask that the chair obtain clarification. Residents, parents, students, and employees of the district will receive priority on the list of speakers. If a speaker is not present when his or her name is called, the opportunity to speak will be considered waived. Only persons signed up may speak Speakers may not give their time to another person or have someone else speak on their behalf. Individuals may address the board for a maximum of three minutes. Any person who is an appointed representative for a group may address the board for five minutes. A representative must state his or her affiliation prior to speaking or will be assigned the three minute period. The board will not hear an open session complaints about performance of school personnel, personnel issues, or confidential student issues. Should a speaker wish to seek information or share items that may not be shared during public comments, our staff are available to address your concerns or provide information. Dr. Brad Breedlove, 
Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Bashan Harris, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, Colin Moore, Assistant Superintendent for Administration and Operations, and Jared McCraw, Assistant Superintendent of Student Services, are here to assist. The first speaker we have tonight is Heidi Cristaldi. Good evening. I wanna start by thanking all of you for continuing to give us the freedom to choose whether our kids can wear masks to schools. I appreciate your boldness and for following the science when not many others are. I'm grateful for each of you. But what I really wanna to do tonight with my time is implore you to find a way to stop the indoctrination that is happening in our classrooms. Now I know you all say that there's no critical race theory in the curriculum, and that might be true, but that doesn't mean that it's not being taught. Let me give you an example. My daughter is an AP English language and composition and was required to read a novel called Into the Wild by John Krakauer this year. I read the syllabus at the beginning of the semester and I talked to my daughter as she was reading the book. I thought it was innocuous enough. I could see why it would be read and studied in school. Let me give you the brief synopsis. It's the true story of a 24 year old man who abandons his family and society after graduating at the top of his class in college and as a student athlete. He does this by donating his savings to charity, he gets rid of his possessions, and he journeys into the Alaskan wilderness. And spoiler alert, he dies. At the time, I figured there were lessons to be learned here, that there were literary reasons why this book was chosen. I didn't think much about this book selection. But then my daughter spent a couple of weeks in class on this book, and her teacher continually pushed the narrative and encouraged the students to accept the narrative that this book's main theme and the main character's motivation was white privilege. She did this through multiple class discussions and graded assignments. Wasn't so innocent of a book selection after all. It looked good in the curriculum, but not in how it was being taught. But don't just believe me. I encourage you all to ask other English teachers in this county or to go ahead and Google themes of Into the Wild. And you will find there's a lot of themes mentioned and not one of them is white privilege or anywhere near it. The book is about self-reliance, risk, arrogance, the allure of nature, and on and on. White privilege is a key tenant of critical race theory. And critical race theory is a far-fetched intellectual and social movement that does not belong in our classrooms. Our kids should not be shamed for the color of their skin or be told that they are oppressed or they are oppressors because of um, something they have no control over. Sadly, my kids come home from school and they know their teacher's political affiliations. They know their teacher's social justice causes that they support. And unbelievably, they know their teachers' sexual orientations. And they shouldn't know these things. Our children are not social justice warriors, and they should not be indoctrinated in school to become one. Union County Public School teachers need to stick to what my tax dollars pay them to do. Teach reading, writing, math, science, and actual history. Teach my children how to think, not what to think. Stay out of my child's social, emotional, and religious upbringing. That's my job. And your job, Board of Education, is to find a way to find out what they're actually teaching and punish those teachers that go outside of academics. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Noise Harrigan. Good evening. When I attended the joint uh, meeting last week, I arrived a couple minutes late, so um, I was surprised to find that the county was making a case for delaying action on quarantining and contact tracing until, quote, cases are declining in the current surge. I was even more surprised that upon some simple questions by Mr. Sides, the county was unprepared to provide a meaningful definition of the word decline that they had planned to use. Uh, based on the Union County data that I looked at last night, we've been, we've been in a decline for the last two weeks. From the 9th to the 16th, positive tests dropped 30%. From the 16th to the 25th, they dropped another 39%. Assuming the most rigorous of the definitions Ms. Lancaster gave, it looks like we've arrived and that this should be sufficient to make moves, as Reverend Benchin put it. Going forward, um, the, the focus of the resolution was to be on developing a collaborative approach with the health department. Um, to, quote, find a process that works in the long term and is, in, and is sustainable. Forgive me for my lack of faith here, but for two years, public health agencies have been wrong on every issue relating to COVID that matters. The local organizations followed the state and the state followed the CDC and they punished anyone who did otherwise. 
perhaps the Union County folks, you, you guys know the Union County health folks better than I do, but I do feel like public health agencies are now a scorpion asking to cross the stream on our backs. In working with these folks, I'd like to offer a few recommendations to avoid being stung. One, I'd urge you to not accept any distinction between vaccinated and unvaxxed individuals in terms of any COVID policy. As Ms. Heintel pointed out at the meeting, both groups are getting and transmitting the virus, so this distinction is irrelevant. Two, I'd urge you not to offer any consolation prizes. The health departments love the idea of testing in schools and using schools as vaccination sites, but both open the door for increased medical intervention in schools. Three, I'd urge you not to base quarantine on future positive test or positivity rates. While it may seem uh, reasonable to have an impartial metric in place, uh, there are a couple of problems with that approach. One, positive tests are not COVID cases. Two, tests are arbitrary in that we do not determine the technology used or the supply of tests or any other metrics. Three, test counts will probably increase again. Uh, do we want to go back to quarantining and contact tracing for a new and even less serious variant? And probably most importantly, no one is contact contact tracing adults or tying adult quarantines to case counts because we know it's not fair and we do not put up with it. If it's not fair to do to adults, it's not fair to do to children. It's immoral and therefore irrelevant whether the tests are going up or going down. Ending the pointless isolation of healthy children now is the morally correct course of action. Uh, thank you also, Ms. Merrill, for bringing actual facts to the meeting about the Union County hospital beds and their utilization by COVID patients. Thank you all for advocating for our children at the joint meeting and thank you for your time tonight. Deb Helms. So I think it's safe to say I have completely exhausted the toolkit conversation. I know I have. When I started speaking at these meetings back in the spring of last year, it was on the topic of masks. My kindergartner was doing virtual kindergarten at a charter school, and we knew we were going to end up having to move her to UCPS. So I want to thank you for your mask optional stance and her opportunity to have a quality education. I just want to say that I am not anti-vaccine by any stretch. My children have received all vaccines that provide them protection against serious and deadly or injury such as polio and measles. We do not, as a family, receive the flu shot, nor do we plan to receive the COVID-19 shot because we choose instead to take care of our body and strengthen the host. I knew when I began this journey that ultimately there was one target in mind from the state DHHS, mandatory vaccines. Surprise. Tomorrow, the North Carolina Health Board is meeting to discuss mandating the vaccine for rising seniors and 17-year-olds. This agenda is being pushed by our state universities who cannot mandate the vaccine for fear they are going to lose their federal funding. So they're passing the buck to the state health board to make that decision because they don't want to lose any money. I saw an article yesterday in regards to a vaxathon that they're doing in Gaston County Public Schools. It is very obvious that this is, in fact, the end game from the state level. That is also made quite apparent in the toolkit because the unvaxxed are the only children who are still currently faced with quarantine and exclusion, even though it is widely known from all of the national health organizations that the vaccinated can still catch and spread COVID, yet they're allowed to return to school immediately after exposure. I know it has been said previously that Union County will not host vaccine clinics on our school properties, and I hope the pushback to not allow mandated vaccines is just as strong as it has been in regards to quarantine, exclusion, and contact tracing. Ideally, I would like to see a policy put in place to preemptively protect our rights for medical and religious exemptions to provide additional leverage when the state starts pushing hard. And I also hope that the pushback, the idea of a test to stay program is equally as strong. Just to remind you, my six year old has a damaged blood vessel in her nose from mask wearing. The thought of continuously swabbing her nasal passages is even more concerning for me because of the potential for aggravation of her medical condition caused by these ridiculous mandates. But despite our special circumstance with medical condition at the end of the day, unnecessary mandates are just plain wrong. Medical overreach by the state and the school personnel has no place. I have said time and time again, our children's health is not for sale, and our decisions are made with our medical provider. I'm truly thankful for the strength that the majority of this board has shown time and time again, and I'm here to encourage you to continue that strength and protect our children from unnecessary medical testing, treatment, as well as continued mental and physical abuse. Our local officials, officials are our last line of defense. The nine of you stand between government overreach and my six-year-old. Please hold the line. Thank you. Stacy Swanson. 
Good evening, board and my community. I have heard lately about the curation of literary materials, the appropriateness of our libraries, and panic over the content of supplemental text. You can imagine my surprise when during both policy and curriculum committee meetings, there was a consistent speaking on and proposed changes that could expedite the removal of literature from our schools. This is a disservice to our children. For parents and community that are unaware, there is already a process for the approval and the removal of library resources. For books to be added to the library, they must first be reviewed by media specialists for content, context, and age appropriateness. To be removed, a review process commences that includes media specialists, administration, and community members, often a parent or parents. Parents always have the right to opt their child out of an assignment or have an alternative given. There are already controls and protections for these parental choices in place. Those that are coming before you to cause fear about content of our libraries or coursework are not fighting for parental choice or rights of review. They already have them. I encourage you and my community to not shy away from the value of discomfort, but to lean into it, to have difficult conversations, and to keep literature of value accessible to all. Now, I, as a parent, am far more concerned about the effects of social media on our children than reading a controversial or potentially uncomfortable book that she may or may not even read and that I likely have the right to opt her out of in the first place. Is there the same collective outrage for TikTok challenges and Twitter and the inappropriate content that lives there? Do we monitor what children receive on their cell phones? Snapchat? I assure you there is horrendous content there as well. According to a study conducted by the Royal Society for Public Health and the Young Health Movement, Instagram is actually ranked the worst out of all social media platforms in terms of detriments to the mental health of young adults. 91% of 16 to 24 year olds use the internet for social media. The study determined that social media has been described as being more addictive than cigarettes and alcohol. Social media use is often linked to increased rates of anxiety, depression, and poor sleep. Now, I assume that most of us here utilize a social media platform, and you know that it's a jungle out there. <laughs> but imagine if you're a tween or a teen right now. I couldn't. Perhaps we should start examining what inappropriate materials through another lens and use a shared focus on what we can control at home. Thank you. Erin Evans. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening and for your continued service to the Union County Public Schools. Before I begin, I would like to state my sources for information, which include the U.S. National Library of Medicine and National Institutes of Health and the Center for Disease Control, which includes the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. I am here this evening to speak about the misconception of vaccine hesitancy as it relates to COVID-19 and our children. According to the January 10th toolkit, exposed vaccinated children do not need to be excluded from school if they are symptom free. However, an exposed unvaccinated child must be excluded from school for five days after exposure. According to the CDC, infections in fully vaccinated persons caused by COVID-19 may be transmissible to others. So why can symptom-free vaccinated children return to school while symptom-free unvaccinated children must quarantine? My husband and I choose, to or choose not to vaccinate our children for COVID-19. The question I often get is, you vaccinate for everything else, right? My answer is of course, and here's why. Between January 4th, 2020 and January 26th, 2022, 883 children between the ages of 0 and 18 have died from COVID-19, roughly 0.102% of all COVID-related deaths. Comparatively, as of January 21st, 2022, 83 children between the ages of 0 and 17 have died from adverse side effects from the COVID-19 vaccine, while another 2,886 children have been hospitalized. The potential long-term side effects of the COVID-19 vaccine are still unknown. 
Children between the ages of five and 11 were made eligible for the vaccine on December 19th, 2021. According to the CDC, this vaccine trial lasted approximately six and a half weeks. Polio, which is a disabling and life-threatening disease causing paralysis and even death in children under five, had 26 years of trials. Polio is very contagious, and thanks to the vaccine, the United States has been polio-free for more than 40 years. Has our technology and science advanced significantly since polio was discovered and a cure was obtained? Absolutely. Does that mean that there is data to support that there will be no long-term side effects in children from this new COVID vaccine? No. To put it simply, polio, measles, and mumps are childhood diseases. COVID-19 is not. The polio, measles, and mumps vaccines prevent infection and stop transmission. The COVID vaccine does not. I am grateful for the respect the Union County Board of Education has shown parents by keeping masks optional and leaving the decision to the parents. Please consider updating the toolkit to not penalize unvaccinated children. Thank you again. Sandy Patel. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sandy Patel. I'm a parent of a child in the UCPS school system, a Union County resident and a physician. But for my time today, I'm going to set aside my physician hat and I'm coming to you as a concerned parent and a citizen. Uh, regardless if you have a child in the public school system or not, all communities benefit from having children that receive well-rounded, globally focused, socially inclusive, and historically accurate education. This includes education not only on the core concepts of mathematics and the sciences, something this board, by the way, has shunned, but also education on all the good, the bad, and the ugly that has occurred throughout history. Learning such makes for critical, worldly thinkers. Learning such allows children to realize that an action leads to an outcome, whether it be positively or negatively consequential. Learning, in, in the words of the great Martin Luther King Jr., we are not makers of history, we are made by history. But in the full context of that quote, we, let alone our students, cannot evolve beyond the problems experienced in our past if we cannot gain access to what part of such history requires new paths forward. They cannot forge these new paths if they're not allowed to be cognizant of all that is around them, locally, globally, and socially. To help forward such paths, I do believe in parental rights and decisions. So as long as those rights and decisions do not harm or jeopardize those around them or those in our community, I do believe in parents should be aware of what they are being taught and uh, taught what is being taught to their children. I do believe in parents being active participants in their children's education. I do believe in ensuring that reading material is appropriate based on age, emotional capacity, and sound decision-making by those that are knowledgeable about such matters. What I do not believe in is letting people that have no experience in understanding how young minds are shaped over time suddenly take on the role of a teacher or educator. I do not believe in undercutting the training of our teachers, uh, undercutting the training that our teachers go through, uh, those years spent preparing to help our children prepare for the future. I do not believe in becoming adversarial with our teachers from the atrocities and the bitter truths of our past. Now, while I agree in ensuring that our, now while I agree in ensuring that our children are exposed to such things in a manner commensurate with age and emotional capability, I do believe that the very fundamental structure of the public education system is at risk if we allow those that really have no educational insight to infiltrate the mechanisms of how children learn. Today, I am challenging this board to uh, not add further destruction to the already fragile school system. Stay true to your stated core value of leadership even when decisions are unpopular. Stay true to your stated core value of organizational responsibility and citizenship to this county. Letting teachers do their good work will help you achieve this. Stay true to your stated core value of management by fact, something that you definitely have neglected to do over the last couple of years. Perhaps ignoring all that I've stated above makes things more comfortable for all of you, but just know that a comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. Catherine Shaw. Good evening, my name is Katherine Shaw. I'm here representing a group of over 40 physicians who are also parents of Union County School students. We really don't know what is left to say to this board since you've made it abundantly clear that your minds are made up regardless of the negative impacts of your decisions. Yet this group has no science or public health background. 
In fact, based on your public comments, it's very clear that you do not understand even the basic fundamentals of pandemic management. For example, members of this board frequently refer to a quarantined individual as healthy. Quarantined individuals are inherently not healthy. By definition, they have been exposed to communicable disease and therefore may become contagious prior to showing symptoms. So to be clear, quarantine persons are those with the potential to infect others before they realize they are sick. Ms. Heintel, you stated that you don't see the difference between the vaccinated and unvaccinated since the vaccinated can get it and spread it too. The difference is quite clear. As compared to vaccinated people, unvaccinated individuals are three to five times more likely to contract COVID following an exposure. They develop viral viral loads and they are contagious for longer periods of time and are at significantly higher risks for developing severe disease. Bottom line, the unvaccinated are more likely to become infected, more likely to spread it, and more likely to die from COVID. Ms. Merrill, you've repeatedly minimized the impact of COVID on hospitals. Just to give you a little perspective, prior to COVID, sepsis, which is a general term for a systemic infection, was the number one reason for hospitalizations, making up 8% of admissions. Right now, COVID patients are taking up 50% of our hospital beds and are one third of all hospitalized patients if you include the overflow patients. This is creating an unprecedented burden for our hospitals and healthcare system. Mr. Sides, last Tuesday you asked, why is the timing of the implementation of this joint resolution relevant to where we are as related to COVID? Our positivity rate is hovering at 40%. This is the highest caseload and disease burden our county has ever experienced. Our outpatient clinics, urgent cares, ERs, and hospitals are all experiencing critical overload in terms of volume as well as acuity. Our, in our schools, there are so many teachers absent, classes aren't covered, there are serious staffing shortages in our cafeterias, and there are no bus drivers. Yet you are choosing this time in the pandemic to promote and push a resolution that will only serve to increase viral transmission and drive up cases even further. Now, it's not your job to understand the basics of pandemic management. No one expected you all to instantly become public health experts in March 2020. In fact, strong leaders are not those with the most knowledge, but they do have the self-awareness and humility to recognize their strengths and weaknesses and seek counsel from experts when needed. Instead, eight of you decided that you could disregard physicians, hospital leadership, our local and state health departments, and well-established, widely accepted proven infection control strategies. Strategies that are based in science, evidence, and now nearly two years of clinical experience. So what's the cost of this blindly, blind disregard of public health experts? Over 40,000 student quarantines since the beginning of the year. Has this board followed, had this board followed the toolkit, the vast majority of these quarantines would not have been necessary. 40,000, not to mention the hundreds, Maybe thousands of COVID cases that had the board followed the toolkit might have been prevented. Do you all take responsibility for our children's lost educational days due to quarantine? No, we only see a projection of blame. Blaming first our public health director, then our government, then the toolkit, and then the state health department. Mr. Benchin, last week you lamented the Board of Education has been berated over the past few months. It's really almost laughable to think that a board, a member of this Board of Education would complain given the chaos you've put these students and teachers in our community through. And while you all are minimizing the impact of COVID on children and developing strategies to avoid common sense public health measures, there are children in hospitals on ventilators. A staff member spent three weeks on a ventilator. And in January, a Union County Elementary School student lost both of her parents to COVID, both of them. Where's the compassion and the empathy? Where's the humility in admitting your decisions are adding to these tragedies? I urge you today to think about this community, the teachers and the education, safety and well-being of our students. Vote for universal masking as a recommendation by public health experts which va with vast amounts of knowledge in this area. A wise person once said, be humble enough to see your mistakes, be courageous enough to admit them, and Next wise enough Heather Moore said, and wise enough to correct them. Thank you. Good evening, Heather Morissette here. 
we've been sold a bunch of lies for almost two years that has been about our health and safety. This has been about money, manipulation, and maneuvering. The ARPA ESSER funds are monies we have received from the government, and it has held our kids bondage to this North Carolina toolkit. North Carolina received $3.6 billion. Union County has received $77 million for 41000 dollars 41,000 students. ESSER 1 was 4 million. ESSER 2 is 17 million. Now we're up to ESSER 3 at 39 million. Funds have not been used for facility repairs to help minimize virus transmission. Funds are not to improve the air quality. Funds have not been for coordination of preparedness and response. But funds have been for salary, premium pay bonuses, $13 million. Funds have been for unique, unique needs like emotional, social learning. Funds for mental health, for more nurses and more health-related positions. How does the government know more than the parents regarding our kids' health? ESSER 3 now has a new requirement. Within 30 days of receiving the funds, the local education agency must seek public comment on the proposed plan of how you're going to spend the money in order to be in compliance with ARPA. I must have missed the public comments and I would like to see them. I have a letter here from Mandy Cohen's replacement, uh, Cody Kinsley, stating to a North Carolina senator that, quote, the North uh, the toolkit is not legally enforceable document, but rather strong recommendations. This North Carolina toolkit of quarantine, isolating, tracing children has never been about health. Again, it's about money, manipulation, and maneuvering. Our health director, even Dennis Joyner, signed two contracts last year, August 25th and September 3rd, for a new public health nurse liaison at a salary of $115,000 a year for the selling of his office. He has allowed his office to be controlled by the Secretary of the State and the federal government. In North Carolina General Statute, Article 31, Chapter 14-228, if any person bargain away or sell an office shall be found guilty of a Class 1 felony. I am not here to determine if there is willful malfeasance or just plain ignorance. The school board, the county commissioners, and the health department are all operating as corporations. All of this is unlawful. However, I would like to personally thank Reverend Benson, Melissa, and Gary Sides. They were the three that would return my emails, and I appreciate for that. Obey the law and set our kids free and just say no, no, no to this madness. Denise Faulkner. As we enter our third year with COVID, I want to understand from this board what is our end game. At what point do we stop following the CDC who has proved repeatedly they have no credibility and a toolkit and quarantine policy that is basically useless? How many times has the CDC changed mask guidance? The vaccine was supposed to cure the virus and stop the spread, yet it's doing the opposite. Our healthy kids can't go near their classmates, but Hollywood events, concerts, and any large sporting event is safe. See the hypocrisy here? You know the stats for Union County. This week, we have 135 people in the hospital and over 8,300 active cases. That means over 99% of people in Union County don't have COVID. Yet in the January revision of the state's toolkit, they refer to a science brief posted in June 2020 to quote unquote, shape the updated school guidance that warns approximately one in four teachers are at a higher risk of grave consequences from COVID because of their underlying medical conditions. And the data they are using is from 2018. How can we estimate this one in four risk is accurate almost two years later with no follow-up and use it to provide the current guidance? The quarantine policies are also ineffective. My daughter was quarantined twice in a two-month span. Both times I received notifications five days after she was exposed and still going to school, and she tested negative. If we truly want children to stay home when they're sick, let's stop considering every runny nose and sore throat COVID and requiring clearance to come back to school, and parents will do their part. Maybe that's why we have 40,000 quarantined. The schools are not the epicenter for COVID, and the current medical and legislative guidance of do nothing and go hide in your home is not effective. The at-risk population is and always has been 65 and over with pre-existing medical conditions, and many of them are also recovering. Those in the school environment who are at risk have been taking the proper precautions long before COVID. 
Let's get back to learning and let the school administration do their job. I don't want them wasting their time sending impactful COVID cases emails, and I don't want teachers juggling healthy students in quarantine and in their classrooms. I want my middle schoolers to stop carrying 17-pound backpacks around school all day because we are afraid to let them have lockers. I want parents to come back and volunteer in the elementary schools. I want to ensure my high schooler can see her teachers during study hall when she needs help and not have to wait for a hall pass because we have too many kids in the hallway. The reality is most people that come here and stalk the school's social media accounts demanding masks and yelling at you for putting our kids and staff at risk are still living their best lives. Worries and all, they still travel, go out to eat, and leave their homes. And we're always going to have people driving in the cars by themselves, masked up, and that's their choice. But our children deserve better, and we owe it to them to give them back their education and their youth. There is no cure for COVID, and we need to learn to live with it like everything else. When will the board who has defied negative backlash and dire warnings before and have made the best choices for this school district continue to be the trailblazers and end the toolkit in quarantines and let our schools get back to providing a quality education? Thank you. Jody McConkie. My name is Jody McConkie. I'm a Union County resident, a UCPS parent, a former UCPS teacher, and I'm the admin of the page UCPS Voices Unsilenced. UCPS Voices Unsilenced is a Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter page where UCPS teachers and staff, parents, community members, and even students can anonymously voice their opinions and concerns about the current state of our school district. At the current moment, there are almost 300 statements posted and more ready to go. It's a page that never should have been needed because after all, months ago, Dr. Houlihan confidently expressed that he has an open door policy. And upon being notified of the page by a parent expressing her concerns, Reverend Benchin replied that if she can send the email, so can they, and that he hopes they do. Here's the problem. Teachers and staff have reached out to the board. They've asked serious questions regarding policies and actions. They've reached out with their concerns and fears on how the board's decisions have affected them in the classroom. But instead of being met with answers or even being met with a simple thank you for sharing, they've been met with threats to their jobs, intimidation, reprimands, and even instructions from their administration not to contact Dr. Houlihan or the board, and some are even told not to even come to their principal with concerns. It's a toxic workplace situation with an open door that nobody wants to go through for fear of retaliation. One teacher wrote to the board about the toolkit only to be visited by their principal about it the next day. The teacher hadn't, in hadn't included him in the email, so obviously somebody from the board did. Her take on it, quote, they would get to me by intimidating those I care about, namely my principal. Another writes, quote, we aren't silent because we're on the side of the board. We're silent because we fear losing our career. And another bluntly states, quote, the Board of Ed can and will use staff speaking out as weapons against them. Jobs have been threatened and staff have been told to follow directions and keep quiet. Quote, anti-racism work has been put on the back burner out of retaliation by the board and parents screaming CRT. I worry our students of color think we don't care. We care so much it hurts. Quote, I'm careful about what I say, how I say it, and where I say it. I don't trust the board, and I know they are just out to get teachers right now. Quote, I know countless staff that have had their social media stalked and been threatened with the loss of their job, teaching license, and retirement. Quote, we're being told that our concerns are excuses and we need to stop making excuses and step up for our students. Quote, the board sends clear messages to employees with every decision. Dear UCPS employees, you and your concerns don't matter. We will make the decisions. You keep your mouth shut and figure out how to make it happen. You're expendable and can be replaced. So if you don't like it, get out. We don't care. Quote, the secrecy and chaos of all that's going on has left every teacher in my building exhausted. We are all sick of the miscommunication and the, quote, we will handle this however we see fit and forget all who disagree. Quote, I voiced my opinion and was lectured one-on-one. -on -one. Quote, we are terrified to speak out. When we do anonymously voice our questions and concerns through the proper channel with our PAC representative, we receive politically correct non-answers through PAC notes that never address our concerns, so most have stopped saying anything at all. Quote, I made a fake email account with a fake name to email the board. 
I still sometimes get anxious that they could trace my IP address, too afraid to stand up for myself, my colleagues, or my students without hiding behind anonymity. Quote, I spoke out and my position was magically cut. I wasn't the only teacher this happened to. Quote, we get reminders daily about the policies put in place for us on speaking our minds. Quote, it's known that our position can be no longer needed or we can be forced to teach a course we aren't qualified to teach if we need to be forced out. Quote, board members post partisan political memes, trash post, respond to individual emails with sarcasm and indignity, yet we are investigated and threatened if we comment or respond to the contrary. Quote, they don't care what the teachers who are in the trenches each day think about these policies or decisions. We are never asked, just given orders and expected to do the work and keep our mouths shut. Dr. Houlihan, board members, your staff is screaming for help while the school system is crashing and burning. And instead of supporting those who make UCPS great, you're dousing them with lighter fluid. Teachers are resigning in droves and students are being diagnosed with anxiety and PTSD. They need to be heard. In conclusion, and I quote a teacher, to the parents and those supporting us, please keep our hands are tied Kaylee in so Smith. many ways that prevent us from speaking Your out. time has ended. Thank you. Kaylee Smith. Board and community members, good evening. I come before you to discuss a very serious issue that is spreading nationwide. Book banning brought under the palatable disguise of curating and age appropriateness. Make no mistake, this is about censoring and removing content, taking passages out of context in order to remove books from our shared history, whether it's about civil rights, the Holocaust, or slavery, so that all of our children won't have an accurate understanding of our history. Cherry-picking passages to sound salacious and pornographic instead of reading the entire book to understand the context and relevancy of those passages. Making assumptions that our young adults are unable to read, learn, discuss, dissect, and grow from this literature without parents coming in to save them from curse words or mouse breasts, as was the case in the recently banned book Mouse by a school board in Tennessee. It is beyond a reasonable person's understanding unless your goal is merely to censor any book that makes you uncomfortable. So I say to all concerned, there is already a process for the approval and removal of library resources. There is already an option for parents to opt out of any materials they deem inappropriate for their child. What is happening is parents are being rallied for political gain to instill fear in them that their children are being brainwashed, groomed, and otherwise harmed by reading books that have already gone through vigorous approvals. Cherry-picking passages to rile up parents to get them out to vote to get these awful predators that would otherwise allow their kids to read such vile content. In short, those coming before you to fearmonger about the content of our libraries or coursework are not fighting for parental control or rights to review because they already have those rights. They are instead seeking to overreach and make those choices for others. I understand that there is literature that's uncomfortable and makes us emotional or deals with really hard and sad topics like the book Beloved, topics that challenge us to think in ways we may have never contemplated before. That in itself is the value of literature and education. We challenge ourselves to learn new perspectives and engage with empathy and critical thinking. This comfort creates change and growth. We don't make change happen when we are comfortable. We don't learn when we are challenged. I encourage you and my community to not shy away from the value of discomfort but to lean into it, to have difficult conversations, and to keep literature value accessible for all. I'd also like to say I've been very sad tonight to hear all the uh, kind of attacks on teachers. I hope you keep in mind and really pump them up and give them the kudos they deserve. And I'd like to thank you, Reverend Kurt Patrick, for all you do for us, and all of you for serving, even if it's, we disagree at times. Thank you. Dan Oslander. Good evening. I grew up in Ohio, moving here two years ago. I worked while in high school at the county library where I was a page. I spent much of my time shelving books, which the public had borrowed and returned. The books went into three general areas, children's, adult, and, excuse me, adult fiction, adult nonfiction, and a secret fourth area in the back room. This is where we hid books that were considered prurient, lurid, or inappropriate for the open shelves. We had books as colorful as Lady Chatterley's Lover, as dry as Ulysses, and even some anatomy te texts. We had a limited number of customers who perused that area and the occasional customer who filled out a reserve slip for secreted books. We did not ever, ever hide books about black or Muslim or Jewish or Asian or German or Italian or French history. 
books about slavery, the Holocaust, World War II, Pearl Harbor, Hiroshima, and other historical events, real or fictional, were freely available in the open stacks. Our Constitution grants us freedom of speech. Freedom to read and learn follows directly. The issue comes down to whether we will allow our children to learn, study, and think about society's mistakes, simple or egregious, and hopefully not repeat them. There are often two sides to historical events and issues. I'm not afraid to present these issues to our children and let them form opinions based on their own morals and knowledge. Having them make decisions based only on what a prejudiced uncle or a playground friend tells them is dangerous. The classroom is the correct place to introduce all aspects of history, whether world, United States, North Carolina, or local. It should be done neutrally, allowing the student to listen, think, and form their own opinion. There are those who don't believe astronauts walked on the moon. There, was, there are those who don't believe the Holocaust ever happened. And there's also some who still think the Earth is flat. Hopefully, most of us have gotten past that one. We must teach, study, and think history, not ignore it. Ignoring history is ignorant and will doom our children to repeat it. Thank you. Calling Kamelnik. Good evening. My name is Colleen Kamelnik, and I live in Monroe. I stand before you a regular mom, a wife, and a it. I stand up here for my children, your children, and the children of those who cannot stand up for fear of public speaking or repercussion from employers. It was not that long ago that I dropped off my children at school every morning with true confidence the school was educating them in a healthy, non-biased environment. COVID changed all that. And then slowly I saw every truth, every piece of science and sliver of common sense go away. We were coming up on the two-year anniversary of two weeks to flatten the curve. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Ben Franklin first spoke these words and they could be no truer today. Once I turned off the news, began doing my own research, going to the data sources, listening to those smarter than me, I could no longer not act. I became responsible for the light I was given. I began attending and speaking at our children's former charter school meetings, the Joint Health and Human Services Board, and now the Board Education Meeting. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. You should recognize that it as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Recently, I saw the video. Hopefully you've all seen it by now and agree the censure is warranted. The video where Reverend Kirkpatrick states that I'm not concerned about humanity. I'm making a mess. This sounds real stupid and it's pissing him off. The one where he states that even if he doesn't agree with me, he will not destroy me or belittle me. I believe that video speaks for itself. At what point do we get equally passionate about early intervention and treatment and eradicate COVID? Quit quarantining healthy children and putting the burden on their shoulders when the rest of the community walks around and goes to Reverend Kirkpatrick's church, maskless, moving on with life. In the video, he alludes because I'm a white female, I can't know what civil rights are, regardless of the fact that both of my paternal great-grandmothers were German Jewish women. My husband's father immigrated from Cuba in his teens. You, sir, have judged me by the color of my skin and not the content of my character. So shame on you for that. I'm ready to be a bigger part of the solution, to give the people in my district a voice, and to have a seat at the table. Let this serve as notice of my intention to file as candidate for Board of Education District Number One. Thank you. Kathy Powers. Good evening. <clears throat> Parents have spoken ad nauseum over the past few months about how to best protect their children from illness. What has not been spoken about are ways to make sure that our immune systems are functioning at their greatest potential and how schools can help us achieve that goal. Two of those ways are through good, healthy, clean food and more physical activity. Nationally, 40% of children are obese. 50% of children between the ages of 2 and 15 already have fatty streaks in their arteries, literally early stage heart disease. 7% of children and teens have high cholesterol. 
33% of all U.S. children will end up with type 2 diabetes at some point in their lives. 40 to 53% of African American and Latino children will get type 2 diabetes at some point in their lives. Obesity, heart disease, diabetes are all co comorbidities for very popular illnesses making their rounds through our lives these past few years. School food has gotten a bad rap, but it's no worse and in many cases it is a little better than what children may be eating outside of school. Despite regulations intended to make school food healthier, the offerings at many schools still mimic processed fast foods with lower calorie sodium and fat. And since juice can count as a fruit, many children are not eating fruits or vegetables at school or at home. We can educate children until we are blue in the face on the benefits of eating good clean foods, but it is also our responsibility to practice what we preach. I've seen the elementary food menus and we need more practice. We need to take into account the amount of sugar that is being offered to our children during school meals and we need to reduce it. Our children need better choices. As far as exercise goes, is there a way we can try to increase the amount of physical education classes required for students? At the elementary level, it would benefit students to have at least two classes a week all year long. At the secondary levels, it would greatly benefit students to have at least two classes every week, all year, every year. Over the past two years, we have been served nothing more than distractions from the bigger issues of chronic illness, especially in children. Good, clean food, water, and exercise are permanent solutions to our permanent problems. I am happy to work with whomever I have to and try to implement better food options and more physical activity for our students. Thank you. Cecilia Howe. Hello, good evening. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, so we often speak of the concerns we have as parents, but more often than not, there are no practical solutions offered. At our previous Board of Education meeting on January 11, 2022, and I'm going to apologize because I might butcher his last name, Adam Sepurek with Anderson White and White provided an audit of our 2021 school year. What stood out was $4.7 million of an assigned COVID relief funds that could bring about an agreeable solution in mitigating infection diseases in our classrooms beyond just COVID and its variants. I would like to propose the use of funds or allocations of funds uh, dedicated to the installment of an air purification system to all Union County public schools. Uh, there are products available now that will provide a safe, effective, and active treatment without having to remove students from the classroom. Uh, one company utilizes high energy clusters, uh, HEC technology, to seek out and attack, attack pathogens and viruses continuously. Uh, this technology has been researched at the University of Florida, their Department of Medicine, and found that the product is proactive in air and surface purification. Um, it inactivates 73.33% of infectious high-level SARS-CoV-2 on stainless steel surfaces within only 15 minutes of exposure to 93.3% after 60 minutes and 97.7% after four hours. In 24 hours of exposure um, to this uh, proactive technology, the study shows that SARS-CoV-2 was undetectable. This technology would also target 50 other viruses, pathogens, and VOCs. The time it takes to attack these pathogens is within one to two seconds in most rooms. The cost of these units, which I know the last time it was brought up, you guys said that it was cost prohibitive, but um, I'm, er, I urge that you guys look into this because it is actually feasible. Uh, the cost of these units would depend on the age and the makeup of the current HVAC units in each school. If the HVAC units are found to be satisfactory, only a single unit costing approximately $1,000 would be needed to purify the entire scope that the HVAC covers. If the unit is outdated and not found to be satisfactory, um, then one unit per classroom setup would be required to generate the same coverage. The cost of the single in-class unit is also under $1,000. Um, there would be zero to no maintenance required, no cleaning or changing of filters, only the cost to install, which may already be covered under the service maintenance agreement the county has as these products are installed into existing units and there would be no retrofitting is uh, required. Um, I have, uh, my husband and I actually reach out to two separate companies that offer uh, similar products, but would need the number of, number of classrooms uh, 
you know, to get a thank you very uh, much. Quote. Yeah. Our next speaker is Norm Peralt. Hi, my name is Norm, and I'm the father of three girls at Union County Public Schools. I was having dinner with my family at a chain restaurant, and one of my daughters ordered a garden salad. It's arguably the most classic, the most American appetizer, short of maybe buffalo wings. And we are all pretty much aware of what a garden salad consists of. Iceberg lettuce, shredded carrots, and maybe some shredded cabbage. So you can imagine my surprise when I saw kale on my daughter's garden salad. I personally find kale to be bitter and offensive. And I checked with several people I know, and they all agree that kale is off the table when it comes to their children's garden salads. Now, I don't know if this chain restaurant is starting to put kale in all of their garden salads, or if it's just some rogue sous chef who stuck it in there, but that really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I feel it's my right, my responsibility to stop this kind of thing from happening. And it's not enough that I prevent my daughter from having kale in her garden salad. I insist that no parent in the area needs to deal with the horror of kale on their children's plates. So my next steps are clear. I'm gonna reach out to the president of this chain restaurant and demand that a salad content committee be set up and that concerned parents such as myself are invited to participate. And I'll make sure that parents have a loud voice in those committee meetings. I don't care how many executive chefs or food scientists they have across the table. When it comes to the garden salads that our children consume, it's important that parents' concerns are addressed. Now, kale is definitely the first ingredient we wanna ban, but I know there will be others to follow. I don't think quinoa belongs in my daughter's rice. So I expect that I, along with other concerned parents, will target quinoa next. And who knows, if this restaurant starts trying to sneak in chia seeds in my children's smoothies, you know that we will rise up and stop that from happening. Okay, hopefully you will see the absurdity in this proposal. I won't be meeting with anyone to form a salad committee. After all, these restaurants have experts in the space deciding what belongs on their menu. And if I have a problem with their choices, I and my children don't have to partake. That's the kind of freedom we have in this country. In recent months, and even here today, we've heard some parents decide, demanding that they have a say in the content that's available in our school libraries and classes. And while that sounds reasonable enough, you have to ask yourself, will parent representatives actually represent the opinions of all Union County parents? Or will they be most likely be the parents with the most extreme views on these matters? Personally, I trust that educational experts, those that understand child development and age appropriateness, will make the right call on the content in our library and in our classes. And if you wanna get opinions of parents, I suggest you make use of surveys where all parents can have their voices heard and not just the loudest, most extreme voices. So I caution you, if you vote on reformulating the committees that decide on the content available to our children, please make sure that it's measured and only is in an advisory capacity. Otherwise, you may find that somehow all of the content that can really help our children grow, just like kale and quinoa, will soon be banned. Thank you. Richard Don't. Good evening. Uh, Richard Don't speaking for Free UCPS Group. Thank you for the time you spent last week with the BOCC to discuss the joint resolution to end quarantines and contact tracing. I especially appreciated the questions that you asked the uh, human services representative. They were not difficult technical questions, but they were very relevant. What is the connection between cases and the goal of the joint resolution? That is a very basic and important question that the health department had no answer for. They had no answer because there is no answer. They don't have any evidence to back up their demands. They only talk about how they need to feel comfortable well, where is the comfort for the families who have to pay for alternate childcare for the fourth time this school year because both parents have to work outside the home? Where is the comfort for the children who are losing significant in-person learning time and socialization during their crucial formative years? Where is the comfort for the children of abusive households whose only respite is school? Union County has a population of almost 250,000 people. Just think of all the thousands of families who are suffering because a few bureaucrats feel uncomfortable. It's an outrage, it's disgusting, it's an insult for them to continue to ask you to cooperate with 
evidence-free mandates. There's a word for practices based on fear of the unknown, superstition. The health department are asking you to comply with superstitious practices that cause irreparable harm. Tonight we've heard from people with a superstitious devotion to masks, vaccines, and all the rest of the failed health policies. Some of them think they should not be questioned because they have medical training and we don't. But we don't need medical training to see that some very basic things are wrong. If you hired a computer expert to fix your computer, what would you say if he started hitting it with a hammer? Oh, he's the expert. In the same way, people with medical training are taking a hammer to the health of our community and reprimanding us for questioning them. Well, a PhD doesn't make you immune from peer pressure and mass hysteria. Around the world, the tide is turning against COVID measures as the damage becomes more and more evident and more courageous people speak up. The UK and Denmark are dropping all restrictions. Finland announced the same today. Sweden never strayed far from normal to begin with. During times of mass hysteria, it's very easy to get caught up in it and think within the hysterical framework. Hindsight is 2020, and we're reaching the point at which most people are starting to recognize that the world has reacted hysterically to this virus. As time goes by, and it eventually becomes very widely recognized, will you be able to look back and proudly say, we acted early to protect our community from the fear? And as far as the law goes, as was mentioned earlier, there was a letter from the NCDHHS in which it was stated that the toolkit is not a legally enforceable document. Can we stop pretending that it is? Let's end the contact tracing, end the quarantines. The law is on your side. I have a little time left, so I just wanted to underscore something that I mentioned at a previous meeting, which was when my friend Harold and I went to the Register of Deeds office in Monroe and hand counted all of the death certificates for 2020. A lower number than 2019. That is such an important fact for everyone to keep in mind. And that is so contrary to what we have been sold about this pandemic. How ridiculous to have a pandemic year in which there are fewer deaths than the previous year. If everyone could just keep that in mind, don't work within these crazy health frameworks that they're trying to force us into. Thank you very much. Maria Reed. Good evening. Tomorrow, our State Commission for Public Health will have to make the most important vote so far, and we pray they will vote no. All the COVID vaccine have proven not to be effective and most importantly, not to be safe. The government fought in court to, to hide the Pfizer cumulative analysis of adverse events report. Thanks to public health and medical professionals for transparency, this official Pfizer report was made public and I will provide you with a copy of it. This document notes that there may be, that there may be underreporting of adverse events. The Pfizer document only, analysis, only analyzes adverse events reports from December 11, 2020, this is the date when Pfizer vaccine was made available to the public through February 28, 2021. This document only reports adverse events that occurred in less than three months. In that time, Pfizer admits the following about the COVID vaccine. 42,000 cases reported, including 159,000 adverse events. This includes 1,300 deaths. This despite the fact that there were that there were 9,400 unknown case outcomes, which could have included additional deaths. COVID infection post-vaccination was reported in 3,000 cases. 136 of these cases resulted in death. Please note that these numbers are only for the Pfizer COVID vaccine and not for all the other COVID vaccines. Pfizer concluded that, I quote, this cumulative case review does not raise safety issue, unquote. Taking these COVID vaccines is like playing Russian roulette. And where there is risk, there must be choice. I want to point, point out to those that keep saying we're not going back to normal. Well, speak for yourselves. 
If you want to continue living in fear, fear, that's your choice. Most of us have moved on. We are not prisoners of a virus made in a lab by a man who did medical experiments on orphaned and minority children. I also want to show you something on this. Um, this is an advanced filtered face mask. One of the warnings in the back says, this product can only be used as a barrier face covering face mask. Barrier face covering face masks do not eliminate the inhalation of pollutants or contaminants in the air, nor do they eliminate the risk of contracting infection, illness, or disease. This is um, a pack of children's face masks, and there are 11 warning statements here. I'm only going to read one. Not intended for antimicrobial or antiviral protection or related uses, or uses for infection prevention or reduction or related uses. I'm going to read it again. Not intended for antimicrobial or antiviral protection or related uses or uses for infection prevention or reduction or related uses. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. That concludes 60 minutes of public comments. My apologies to the speakers who did not get a chance. Um, that brings us board to the approval of the minutes from the January 11th open session meeting minutes. So moved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Next is consent. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. aye. And that brings us to Dr. Houlihan and the superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. February the 1st always marks the beginning of some new things across uh, Union County Public Schools, including Love the Bus Month. I want to encourage our public, our staff, our parents, our students uh, to really take some time this month to say thank you to our bus drivers and our transportation staff. Uh, we uh, recognize your hard work. We appreciate all that you do each and every day, and we know that you are a significant part of the backbone and operations of our of our successful school district. So thank you for what you do. Um, it is also today, is all, this always fascinates me, um, it is also today, today also marks the time to kick off um, uh, our kindergarten registration. And we are pleased to welcome our new students and parents to UCPS. Uh, and this all, again, this always baffles me, uh, but we are uh, kicking off kindergarten registration for the class of 2035. Uh, so think about that. Uh, parents, we, we want to encourage you to view our kindergarten webpage for details and to follow their child's school on social media for updates. During the week of February the 7th, we will celebrate our school counselors, as that is National School Counselors Week, which highlights the tremendous work our school counselors do each day and the impact they have on our students. This year's theme is Better Together, a familiar theme across UCPS. And to our counselors, we want to say thank you for all that you do, and we look forward to also celebrating you this month. And lastly, uh, our student support department is offering a series of workshops uh, designed to help parents with some very difficult topics. Uh, UCPS will be offering a parent series this spring to help families navigate through topics such as grief, trauma, becoming a tech healthy family, and family wellness. Dates, times, and locations will be released tomorrow on our social media pages, website, and through Peach Jar with a digital flyer. Board members, that concludes my report. Thank you. Yeah, Madam Chair, I have a question for yes. Ms. Suinton. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Suinton, I've been waiting for your comments ever since uh, Ms. Jody McConkey yes. uh, gave her comments. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to ask... Uh, that um, she um, laid out several scenarios where folks have been bullied, shut down. Can you speak to that concern? Because uh, we just had two visits over the last couple of weeks, one to East Union Middle School and one to Monroe Middle School. And uh, both of those visits... Uh, produce uh, great feedback from both student, teachers, and administration. And we, uh, I, encourage them, as I have from, you know, this seat, numerous occasions, that if they have any concerns, always speak up. And I believe it was 
uh, Ms. Heidel, who may have said, and correct me if I'm wrong, we don't know what we don't know. And so to those, to that teacher out there, let's just say what Ms. Jody said had an ounce of relevance. An ounce of relevance. What do, you, what do you say to that teacher to get that teacher over the hump to express themselves, uh, their concerns? So multiple things Reverend mentioned. Number one, I, I would reiterate my expectations of myself, of my cabinet staff and of our, our school leadership that yes, I do have an open door policy. An open door policy is a two-way street. My door can be open, but you have to also be willing to come and walk through it. Um, I have met with teachers in the past. I, I have a meeting this week with a teacher. Uh, and so I have no issues at all or conflict with sitting down with any employee and talking about the concerns that they have and in any context. Um, but it takes you to also want to reach out to me to have that similar conversation. That's number one. Number two, I did hear a comment from her that uh, about principal, the role that the principal plays. Anytime we have a staff member that communicates something to, to me or to our team, whether it's their supervisor or a principal, I do want to loop our, our folks in because oftentimes uh, we get questions or, or concerns that at the local, most local of level, which is the school building, uh, we try to resolve those concerns that, that anyone may have. And so I do want our supervisors and our principals, um, but our staff and I have never given a directive to a principal to say, shut anyone down. Um, if that is happening, I'd like to know about that. And we'll deal with that as well. But when I hear these kind of, of concerns, um, I want it brought to my attention firsthand, not through any other channel. And until I have that evidence in that conversation, I, I don't know how to fix anything. So I just want to reiterate to all of our staff, my expectation of, of my cabinet members, of me, and of our principals is that we work collaboratively to address any concerns or challenges without any fear, any fear of any kind of, of retaliation. I, I, can, I can speak that people have heard me. People have heard me when I've said that. And people have emailed me, just like I'm sure they've emailed the other eight members of the board. Sometimes they email everyone and staff. So I, I'm just concerned you know, I know folks have the liberty to just say what they want to say, but again, and I will say, where's that camera? At? <laughs> I will say again, if you're someone that Miss Jody was speaking for tonight, someone that has feels as though that you cannot say something for fear, email me and you will see that you will get results. Okay, board, that brings us to the COVID-19 update. I'm gonna turn it over to Jared McCraw. Good evening, Ms. Merrill, members of the board, Dr. Houlihan, Ms. Morris. Uh, the first thing tonight I'm coming with is a COVID update for Union County Public Schools. Uh, last month, when I come to you, uh, our numbers after winter break, we anticipated would be on the uptick, and that is what happened. But this month, I come with better news. We're starting to see a decline in positive cases over the last two weeks that have been reported by students and staff uh, to Union County Schools. That is good news. We're starting to see that decline that we anticipated Uptick first after winter break, now we're starting to see it settle and we're starting to see less positive cases. Two weeks and the first two days of this week, we've seen less cases reported. The positivity rate remains high, but it, you're seeing statewide that that is starting to decline. Talking with public health, which we still do twice a week, and I talk to Mr. Joyner daily, uh, we're seeing that that positivity rate in Union County is gonna start settling that is, is what we're hoping for. The number of new cases per day on a seven-day average is, is declining as well. That's 
the three measures we've been using internally to look at are the number of positive cases with UCPS students and staff, the positivity rate, and then the number of cases per day. All of that is starting to decline. Good news for Union County Schools, and, and that is a positive thing for us as a school district. So that really concludes my report on COVID cases at this point or COVID in Union County Schools. And then I'll step back and see if you have any questions. Thank Jer you. Oh. Go ahead. Uh, Jared, I, um, I'm kind of a visual type, so I like to, uh, I'm by no means I'm a master of Excel, but I like spreadsheets to see it clear in front of me. And I, I shared this information with you. It's very obvious we had uh, a spike in the week of January 10th. And that week we had 1,331 cases. Yes, sir. And it is also very clear in looking at these figures that these numbers are less than half now. And that trend is accelerating this week. We always get a little bump on Monday because, the, and I'm speaking to impactful cases. Yes, sir. That is correct. We, we always get a little bump on Mondays because of the weekend activity. But if going most recently, we are nearly half, uh, we're about not 50% of where we were last Monday from impactful cases. And that rate of decline is continuing this week. So I see that the spike has occurred as predicted, and it is now um, falling precipitously. Yes. And that appears to be in what the, the numbers that I've seen, is, and it's a, a steady downward uh, spiral, which is always a good thing to see. Is that, is yes. that um, it, in your my, perception? In my conversations with Mr. Joyner, with our lead nurses and his staff, uh, that is the trend. It, it is declining at this point. After the winter break, we're starting to see that decline at this point. Thank you. Mr. McGraw, what is the percentage of the positive COVID cases? Today, it was at 41% positivity rate for Union County. Which is still considered high, correct? Yes, sir. That would yes, be sir. a high rate. Yes, sir. Uh, if I could, I, I want to address that uh, because that is one point that I tried to stress at our joint meeting in that there, there is the county positivity rate, which I understand the health department looks at because their responsibility is Union County. And then for me, there are impactful cases at UCPS, which is what I lean on because that's our kids and our staff in our buildings. So while one infection is one too many, one positive case is one too many, I understand that there can be a little bit of a lag in the county numbers and the county numbers figures are going to include people that are not staff, that are not of student age and situations could be entirely different than our students and staff in our buildings. So this is kind of a uh, six or half a dozen. What numbers do you want to go by? And I'm, I'm leaning on the impactful numbers because I think the, this whole joint statement resolution is about us because we're doing the contact tracing and we're doing the quarantining here at UCPS. So I'm relying on our data, on our students and our staff. And I don't wanna say the county infection rate is irrelevant, but may perhaps a better statement would be, I don't think it's most indicative of what is happening at UCPS. The, the positivity rate, uh, in my talks with Mr. Joyner over the last couple of weeks, there are a lot of variables that impact that, including availability of testing, uh, who is getting testing. So um, is it a variable? Yes. But um, what we're looking at more now is the impactful case data and the number of cases for that seven-day rolling average of case, new cases per, you know, per person. So 
Is the positivity rate still there? Yes, but there are a lot of variables that impact that with it going up. Okay. Last Tuesday, the Board of Education and the Board of County Commissioners passed a joint resolution reaffirming support for ending contact tracing and quarantine requirements for Union County Public Schools. As stated, it is becoming increasingly evident that this virus is not going away, and we have to live with it in a way that doesn't unreasonably risk our children's education and mental health. We need to support the mental and physical well-being of our students by keeping them in the classroom when they are healthy. And given the fact that both vaccinated and unvaccinated persons can get COVID, it makes no sense to have unvaccinated individuals to quarantine if exposed while vaccinated individuals do not have to quarantine if exposed. As many board members have said, especially Reverend Benson, healthy individuals should not have to quarantine. UCPS COVID cases have been declining significantly down by over 50% over the last two weeks. The county's seven day average data also shows a decline in the county's cases over the last week from 612 one week ago tonight to 466 today. With the support of the Union County Public Health Department, I move that Union County Public Schools end contact tracing and quarantine requirements beginning this Monday, February 7th. I second the motion. Okay. If there are no comments, all, all those in favor say aye. Uh, could, could I interrupt for just not really a question, a clarification? Mm -hmm. uh, we are not changing our policy of students or staff that are positive with the virus, with COVID, allowed in the building on property. They are still to isolate. There's no change there. Let me be very clear. Just like if you had the flu, stay home. If you're positive, you're sick, you stay home. Uh, if they are uh, symptomatic, the, the, they, the parents call in, the student or, or staff member goes to the nurse and said, you know, I've got these symptoms which fit the profile of COVID symptoms, then their recourse is to a course except the five-day quarantine, a negative COVID test, or a, a doctor's note, or if they have been positive, COVID positive, in the last 90 days. So that is for symptomatic students and staff. That, that is the way for them, the, the path to return, okay? And I want to make it Understand that the health department has reviewed the data. You've been in discussions even today with Mr. Joyner, and he concurs with us with this motion and moving forward on the joint resolution that has twice been approved by this board, as well as the Board of County Commissioners. And Mr. Joyner is in agreement that uh, it, it is time to act. Is that fair, yeah. Jared? Mr. Joyner agrees that the document that he provided that's included in the board docs provides support that Union County is in the declining trend consistent with that terms in this resolution. Okay. I, would like, oh, I, I would like to confirm, Mrs. Morris, have, have we um, unlocked, um, is that document available to the public on board docs? It was placed on board docs this afternoon. Okay, and it's... It's open, not just to the board members. No, it should be open. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Hindale. And the reason that I, we picked um, February 7th was to give staff, um, Mr. McCraw and staff, to um, get the information out to the nurses and uh, principals and staff. So I, I totally concur with that. I think this is a, a, this is a very important as well as significant undertaking for our 53 schools and entire staff. So I think we need to take the time to do it right. And uh, would you agree that, that Monday is a responsible uh, date to commence? Yeah, your Monday implementation works very well for us. It gives us time to work through communication, work with our principals, our school staff, and our nurses. So this is a 
good process. This is a big undertaking. So thank you for allowing us. Monday is also the day when uh, the county will be meeting. And I think in the spirit of working so well together um, with Mr. Joyner and um, Michelle Lancaster, and I know David Williams has been a, a great help in conversations through the weekend in the past couple of days. Um, so given that they will have a face-to-face -face meeting on Monday, I think um, this honors their timeline as well. And, and Jared, I can't stress, I, I don't want to tell everybody how to do their job, but this is going to take more than just one email out, particularly to parents. Um, and um, per, perhaps to our non-English speaking our parents, it will take some additional uh, means of communication. But we, we need to make it clear how this exactly works um, for their benefit. So there's no, um, I, I want to re remove any possible anxiety on the part of parents of the implementation of this. The safety of the students and staff is still of the utmost concern, but also the mental health and th closing the learning gap. And I also want to take a minute before we vote to thank our, lead, our board leadership, Ms. Merrill, Ms. Hintel, um, leadership, you came to the joint meeting prepared with information, facts for us to make our case. It was very professional, very well done. And Ms. Hintel, I want to thank you for taking the lead on putting together this resolution, coordinating with Jared. Uh, making sure we're all working together. It's not an adversarial relationship with the health department. We've had a few bumps in the road uh, in the past, but we are all on the same page as well with our county commissioners, which is always a good thing. And I just wanna thank our, our board leadership for um, the work that you've done to get us to this point. Thank you, Mr. Sods. Madam Chair, I have yes. a question if I may. Um, so the um, suggestion of which, what we're getting ready to vote on, we are 41% positive COVID rate in the county. And we do not have a mask mandate, which assists with keeping kids in school, right? And we're getting ready to eliminate contact tracing within our schools. The only measures that we we have to assist with this pandemic and i'm trying when we talk about i think mr gary said about the anxiety what have you of parents i think what we're doing is and again i am so tired of talking about this i'm tired of dealing with it it is very stressful and it's very overwhelming and our objective is on this board I believe all of us, when we talk about this, this is to keep children in school, all right? When we talk about a mass mandate, it is to keep children in school. And I believe that each and every one of us on this board are concerned about keeping children in school. I will not disagree with that. But I do have a challenge because when children, just because they are asymptomatic, again, I say, does not mean that they do not have symptoms that excuse me they do not have COVID, and i think it may be a very unsafe decision right now to even take away the only measures that we have to help keep kids safe not only kids but to keep families safe and when we talk about parents we have parents on both sides who have a who have a stance and they they have the responsibility to have a stance but I don't think us eliminating the only mechanism that we have that will help to keep kids safe and to keep kids healthy and to eliminate that and to get rid of that. I don't think that's a wise decision. That's not the only thing. We're isolating um, students and staff who test positive or have, or, or have symptoms. So that's not a correct statement. Well, so I, wait, let, I'm not done. Okay. Well, I'll finish. When you finish, I'll respond. And, there's a lot of states that have been doing this all along mm -hmm. that have kept doing the same thing. They don't have quarantine. They don't have close contacts. They don't do any of that. And they've been working just fine. 
This isn't new in the United States to do this. Georgia, Texas, Florida, South Carolina, Sarah, Arizona. May I respond now? As I've heard on many occasions that we're not like everybody else with Union County Public Schools. And even though others may do what they have done, we're Union County Public Schools. And so to compare, and just because others are doing it, I don't th think that's necessarily a good statement, especially when we have been saying for the longest, and I stand with the statement that we are Union County Public Schools. So just because they're doing it doesn't mean that we have to do it or be encouraged or influenced to do it. I believe that we can, we can establish a protocol that will show others that we're different, we're concerned, not saying that we're not concerned, but everyone has their own level of what they think is concerned. But I just don't think that's a wise statement. And again, that's just my stance. I'm not being disrespectful to any of you, but I believe that I owe it to myself and those that I serve from the east to the west, that we understand that this may not be a wise, a wise choice or wise decision. Madam thank Chair. You, thank you, yes. Oh, mm -hmm. go ahead. You was going no, to talk, no, Madam go. Chair. Um, <clears throat> one of the problems with this from the very beginning was, and, and we're so far down the road that the sides are, you know, so definitively set that people kind of just, a lot of people will just tune somebody out. But one of the problems from the beginning was the establishing of one premise and the dismissing of other premises. Way back in 2020, there were a battalion of doctors, research scientists that did not agree with the methodology of how the initial uh, handling of this was being handled. They didn't agree. Some have never wavered from that. A lot of them were called all kind of kook, anti-science or whatever, but as one person reported on the news the other day, a lot of what folks were saying was false science, people now realize it wasn't false science. And to Ms. Heitel's uh, point, and Mr. Richard Adant said it tonight, uh, Sweden, for example, never adopted the harsh mechanisms that a lot of countries of the world adopted. And you can't go to Sweden and find where they're in COVID uh, abyss. And it's not that we're Union County uh, and uh, we, we are Union County and, and, and we are different than a lot of uh, other places, but that doesn't make the fact that those other places that had these implementations of their procedures uh, not useful in our you know, analysis of this situation because there are states that never entered into these harsh uh, lockdown mechanisms, and you can't go to those states and find where their numbers are astronomical because they didn't. And so um, we happened to be in North Carolina, and North Carolina took certain stances. Well, over time, we can clearly see, you know, that uh, a lot of those other states were more positive than North Carolina's stance. So I think what we're doing here tonight is one, what I've been saying since last May. We have to, like all other things that happen to us when we get sick, we have to make sure that we are taking care of those who are sick and not getting in the business, as I said at the joint meeting, of separating healthy people. And so uh, I, I positively am going to be voting for the motion.
Okay. Yes. Just for clarity, your motion is to include staff and students, correct? Yes. And can you speak to um, if a parent chooses to keep a student out of school for sickness or quarantine, those five days stay in place, excuse? I think that that's some of the stuff that they're getting ready to send to parents and talk about if a, if a parent knows that their child has been exposed, can they, can they um, keep their child home and have excused absences? Yeah, over the next couple of days, we're going to be working through that process and communicating that out to parents and staff members. That gives us the implementation time till Monday gives us time to communicate that out. So we're still working on all those details at this point. It is. Yes, sir. And um, I, I would just like to make a couple of comments um, based on some some misinformation that was shared earlier tonight. Um, we received our date, our report today before our meeting. And keeping in mind that we have over 46,500 students and staff here in Union County Public Schools. There were 26 um, students that tested positive for um, COVID today and 12 staff. So, so when we're looking at Union County Public Schools, um, I'm sure before COVID existed, we had more students testing for something um, than, than 26 or having 12 staff members out um, in one day. Um, I'm very happy to see those numbers going down. Uh, the spirit of the resolution and the, the um, what I remember Deputy County Manager Michelle Lancaster sharing with our board was that they really wanted to see maybe five days of declining numbers. And what what we have looked at over the weekend is that we've had declining numbers in Union County Public Schools for two weeks. And so that, that's the encouraging point, um, the point that I want to remind the board members what we're voting on. Um, two weeks ago, um, we experienced a 37% decline this past week, an additional 50% decline, and just between yesterday and today, over a 50% decline. Um, today, um, we, we learned that Atrium Union Monroe does have 210 hospitalizations, just like we did a week ago. But instead of 69 of those um, being positive a week ago, today it's 48. Um, so we're, we're seeing declines in every area, in addition to the fact that, you know, the percent of COVID patients in our hospitals has dropped from nearly 40% to um, today being 23%. Um, so we're seeing declines in every single area. Um, and, you know, Ms. Lancaster, you know, offered a five-day decline and what um, Mrs. Hintel and Mr. Sides are presenting to our board tonight with uh, the motion in the second is that um, we've had a two-week decline. So um, with that being said, I would like to um, take a point of action. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? So the motion passes eight to one. And again, the um, it will take effect on Monday the 7th. Thank you very much. Okay, that brings us to um, review of face coverings um, by Session Law 2021-130, Senate Bill 654. I'll like, accept a motion. I'd like to make a motion that UCPS continuous mask optional Second. environment. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, so 8-1. Okay, that brings us to the uh, 2022 North Carolina School Board Association Legislative Committee Service. Um, board member uh, Gary Sides, um, we received an email, I believe the board received an email on January 19th um, that you can apply for this, and um, we would like to nominate Gary Sides. Uh, for this, he's already submitted his application for consideration. 
Um, Gary, I don't know if you'd like to speak to it or um, or we can have a motion in a second. I move that we nominate Gary Sides to the NC. Okay. okay. With that, I'll make no comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Mr. Sides, thank you for stepping up and offering to um, to apply to this um, state level um, legislative committee. So 9-0. That brings us to policies for review, and we did have an amendment where we added item F for policy 1-12 public comments. Uh, yes, um, before you, you have five policies that are for regular review, um, 2 8 4 1, 4 15, 5 1, and 6 6. Um, and then you have um, uh, policy 112 um, public participation in board meetings. Uh, as an addition, I am available to any questions for me to answer. Okay. Given the number of su speakers speaking up, I move that we revise policy 1-12, public participation in board meetings to provide for three minutes per speaker. In doing so, my motion includes removing the group designation and five-minute speaking period. I also move that we deviate from the process set out in policy one 14 and make this revision effective for the March meeting. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that brings us to board comments. I want to echo uh, Reverend Benchin that if there's staff out there, please email us. Um, and I understand that sometimes it, it, we do have to talk to the principal. We have to talk to Dr. Houlihan, but please let us know if there's issues. We appreciate it. And I know Dr. Houlihan and his staff, likewise. Um, I just wanted to say how appreciative I was that we did work so well with the county and um, that we were able to move forward with the resolution. And also, um, we're getting ready to ramp up high school registration. So parents should keep their eyes peeled, especially if you have a rising ninth grader, because there's a lot of information that's going to be headed your way that you'd probably want to be attending or reading up on. So I was not here in January, and I just um, I know that January was um, Board of Education Appreciation Month, and I do not think that was acknowledged last month. And I want to tell each and every board member here how um, much I appreciate you. I know your community um, appreciates you, and I just want to say thank you for your service. I also want to say thank you to Dr. Crawford and Dr. Bellamy for hosting two incredible days where we were, yeah. And the teachers and the students were absolutely amazing. Um, the one takeaway, um, many takeaways, but um, the consistent message was that virtual learning hurt our students. And it was really, um, it was really heartwarming to hear our students and our teachers say how much they loved being back in their schools and being with their teachers. And one young um, girl in particular, I'll never forget it when she said, I know that she could feel the love that she felt loved and cared for um, being back um, at her school. And I think I'll always remember that. But thank you to Dr. Crawford, Dr. Bellamy, our, t our amazing teachers, and um, we've got some really incredible students um, here in Union County Public Schools. But thank you um, for those tours of the Ag Tech Academy and our Health and Science Academy. So um, we look forward to our board being invited to more schools and hearing directly from our teachers and students. Madam Chair, uh, let us uh, make sure we acknowledge uh, February is Black History Month and celebrate the great accomplishments of those black Americans throughout the annals of our time. Okay, any announcements? Finance Committee will be on February 22nd by Zoom, 8 a.m. Facilities Committee will be at 9 a.m. on February 23rd at the PDC. The Strategic Planning, Information Technology, and Transportation Committee 
is scheduled to meet February 23rd at 7.30 here at the BDC. Policy, February 15th, 8 a.m. Zoom. Curriculum, we are still working on the final details, but we may be transitioning to a Zoom meeting. Uh, more information to follow. Mr. Price, can you say again what what date is the policy meeting? 2.15. 2.15, thank eight, you. 8 o'clock. Thanks. Okay, if there are no further announcements, I will accept a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Aye.